1 Samuel chapter 8 is our reading for this morning. 1 Samuel chapter 8. Um, I don't know about you, but I am not naturally a patient man. Um, I have a tendency to want everything done now and to be impatient with others. I remember trying to teach Sandra to drive. Huge mistake. We were going together and probably nearly brought uh, everything to an end. Uh, I was teaching her how to do three-point turns. And she'd done the first, she'd done it the first time really well. I thought, well, that's, that was quick. I was really impressed with my teaching skills. Uh, but the second time didn't go so well, and I fell out with her, and I threw her license out the window. But I'm not a patient man. Uh, it's something that I've had to work on. And I, I think most of us, I can't blame everybody, but I think a lot of us have this problem. We're not necessarily patient people. And there are things that were on our patients really, really quickly. Maybe a little bit different for you than it would be for me. And I think that as Christians, that is why we gravitate to this idea of God's patience. It's why we gravitate to certain passages that speak to us of the patience of God. Uh, I think particularly Psalm 136. I love Psalm 136. And it has this repeated phrase in it. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. And I love that idea. His mercy endures forever. And that's not hyperbole. That's true. And as you go through that psalm, it takes you through the nature of God. It takes you through the work of God with his ancient people. It takes you through God's work with us. And at every verse, it reminds us, his steadfast love endures forever. Pop into the New Testament, we think of Matthew 18. When Peter said to Jesus, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times, Lord, I'm being really generous. I'm being a really kind and patient man. Can I forgive him seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. And of course, we know Jesus is saying here, you just have to keep on forgiving. You just have to keep on being patient, no matter how many times you're let down. As we come into this next section of uh, 1 Samuel, we're seeing that patience of God being played out on a large scale in the nation of Israel. And we're seeing this this, uh, side of God's character coming to the fore as he is patient with his ancient people. And so today, as we think about this, we hope to do two things. We hope to rejoice in the patience of God and hold on to the truth of that in our lives. If we are his people, then we know that patience is ours. We understand that his patience runs short with those who reject him. We understand that. But we're thinking about his relationship to us as his people and how his patience goes on, his patience is forever. But also, we're thinking about the example of his patience. Because, of course, if we're to have relationships with one another, then we have to learn how to be patient. And as Christians, we are called to be patient as God is patient. To exercise the patience that Christ has with us for others. So it's both a point of rejoicing and worship and praise and holding on to, but also it's a point which we have to practice in our lives or seek to practice in our lives because we'll, we'll find it tough, I'm sure. The first thing I want us to see in this passage is God is patient with Samuel's lack of discernment. God is patient with Samuel's lack of discernment. First three verses of Samuel, 1 Samuel 8, it says this, When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of the second was Abijah. And they were judges in Bathsheba. Yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted judgment, justice. So, uh, it's maybe appropriate that we come to this on Father's Day. But it is a flaw in many fathers and many parents that we do not see the flaws in character in our children. We are sometimes willing to overlook those flaws because they are our children. 
We think somehow that our goodness, that our walk with God will flow down through our line and that our children will be just like us, that our children will love God the way do we do, that our children will follow God the way that we hope to do. This is a mistake that Samuel made. And Samuel's foolishness was bringing the children of Israel into disaster. But what is particularly hard to, to, to see here, hard because it strikes home very quickly, is that you could easily be six or seven chapters earlier on in First Samuel. In First Samuel 2, we read these words. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. The sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord, for the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. Samuel was sent by God into Israel to deal with the problem of Eli and his sons, his worthless sons who had been raised up to a position of authority within the nation. And how, now we have it, and Samuel is an old man. He has lived well for the Lord. There is no doubt about it. His testimony has been great. And he has brought the people back from uh, awful times in sin to a place of knowing God again. And yet God, or yet Samuel, finds himself not as the, the solver of the problem, but, but of this, as the precipitator of the very same problem that Eli had. Because it's him and his sons that are causing trouble in Israel now. And yet, the wonderful truth that we think of is that God is still patient with Samuel. That even though he has gone from the solution to the problem, God is patient with Samuel. And here we learn a couple of lessons at least. The first thing is that Samuel was had gotten to be wrong in his thinking about God and the way God's works. Samuel had started to think, it seems, that God would work through these boys even though they were involved in all this wickedness. That because they were his sons, because they were his progeny, because they were a part of his family, that somehow God would use them. Somehow what they did would not have the effect that it did have. But friends, that's something that we know is not true. And yet it is a problem within the church of Jesus Christ today because there is, a, there is a way of thinking, isn't there? In church circles where we think that our children will just follow on behind us. They will have the same giftedness that we have. They'll have the same desires that we have. We don't have to look far into the church at large to see this, to see uh, men who have been raised up position, to positions of authority seemingly because of what their fathers achieved. And yet they have fallen into to apostatism. They have fallen into false theology. They have taken their churches that their fathers nurtured and brought them almost to the brink of disaster. We don't have to look far to see Christian denominations built on families. As if this particular family is peculiarly blessed by God. And because there is a... a an evidence of God's blessing at some stage in the life of this family, that that will carry on forever, that it's special to this particular group, this particular bloodline, to this particular name. I always worry when I see Christian ministries in the names of individuals or the names of families because I think that's a very dangerous place to be. You see, we learn, don't we, that our walk with God isn't precipitated upon the people who have gone before us. I can't rely on my father's faithfulness to carry on into my life. I can't rely on some member of my family and their walk with God and think that because I'm attached to them in some way that my walk will be good. No, that's not the way it works. For each of us, we are responsible for the way we walk with God, for our obedience to his command for us following the way that he would have for us. And so it's important for us to learn the lessons that he has given us. And it's important for us to see the responsibility that we have as individuals to learn what he's teaching us. The second thing we notice about this, the second lesson we learn about this is that is a comforting one. Because 
God could have easily cast Samuel to the side at this stage. He's an old man. Perhaps he's served his usefulness and he's made a mistake. Perhaps it's time to put him out to pasture. Perhaps it's time to retire him. But as we will see as we go through Samuel, there is lots more that Samuel has to do. There's lots more work that Samuel does for God. And friends, when we make a mistake, when we get our discernment wrong, when we make bad decisions, when we do foolish things, when we get things, our thinking wrong, even about God and the way he blesses, that doesn't mean that God is finished with us either. Everybody, every Christian has made more than one mistake, even this morning. If God cast us off because of the foolishness of our nature, because of our getting things wrong, then none of us could come here and do anything at all. We wouldn't, buy, we wouldn't lift our heads and worship at all. But God was merciful to Samuel, wasn't he? God continued to work in Samuel. And indeed, as we will see as we go through this book, God is teaching Samuel certain lessons as he goes through and using Samuel to teach those lessons to the people of Israel. Friends, our God is a patient God, and even a man who has made bad decisions, a man who knows him and yet has made bad decisions, he is not cast off. He is not forgotten about. God is patient with him. The second thing we see here is that God is patient with Israel in their rejection of his ways. God is patient with Israel in their rejection of his ways. Let me read verses 4 to 5 to you. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said, Behold, you and your, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint us a king to judge us like all the nations. You know, uh, the people weren't fools. The people of Israel knew enough that Samuel's boys were not good. They were not godly men. And that Samuel was coming to the end of his life. Little did they know how much more he would be involved in their nation's life. They saw the problem. And so, as good problem solvers, they tried and decide, what are we going to do about this? What's the solution to this particular problem? Samuel's old, the boys are no good. What are we going to do? We're going to get a king. We are going to get ourselves a king. And the desire to have a king for this nation is not a bad thing, is it? 400 years before this event, God talked about Israel and their king. And we know that the ultimate plan of God was that one day he would come as their king in the form of Jesus Christ. That the whole point was that the king was coming, that God was coming to rule on earth, that heaven and earth were coming together. And there would be one kingdom and one king uh, for all eternity. But the problem with Israel was that their idea of a king was not for a man to come and to to lead them, a man of God's choosing to come and lead them forward. Not, it wasn't the idea that a man would ascend to the throne and he would lead them to know God better and better in their lives. It wasn't that the ma- this man would take on the crown and that he would teach them to know God's law and lead them in the way God would have them to go. No, that wasn't what they were interested in. They were interested in a king who would help them to be like everybody else, who would help them to blend in with the surrounding nations. It tells us a little later in the next few couple of verses that the whole point was that they were rejecting God's rule over them. They didn't want God to be their king. They didn't want God's command over them. They wanted to do things the way everybody else was doing. They looked at the Phoenicians. They looked at the Philistines. They looked at the people around and they said, we want to be like them. And the first thing that we need to do is we need to get ourselves a king who will teach us to be like them. What do you do with people like that? What do you do with a child who says, I don't want to be your child anymore? What do you do with a child who says, I don't love, I, your love was rubbish, your, your parenting was terrible, everything that you did in my life was an oppression, was awful, was vile, and I don't want anything to do with you anymore. Friends, what would you do if your child said that you, you would break your heart, wouldn't it? And there's nothing you could do, maybe you'd have, but to watch them leave, but God... God, he was patient with his people, even though they didn't want him. 
friends, we thank God that he's patient, don't we? Because before you and I were saved, we spent years rejecting Jesus. Isn't that right? I don't know if you're one of those rare folk who came to know Jesus as your Savior the first time you heard the gospel. They're rare folk indeed. For most of us, it was a journey. For most of us, we were confronted by the gospel, maybe from our youth, right up to old age, maybe for many, many years, maybe in work day after day after day after day, in all the various circumstances that it came. God was patient with us, and when we rejected him, he just came back. And he spoke to us again. We maybe told him to get lost, to stop annoying us, to stop talking to us, to stop stop hammering at our lives. But he came back. Don't we thank God for his patience that brought us to him and that keeps us? Friends, Christian friends, aren't we thankful for the patience of God? You know those days when we think we know better? We've had those days, haven't we? When God says, this is the way, walk ye in it, and we say, not a chance. When the circumstances are crowding around us, and God says, not too quickly, hold on for a moment, and we say, time short, Lord. You haven't answered. We need to get going. We need to get moving. As Christians, we have thought we knew better. We thought our timing was right. We thought that our way was best. But isn't it wonderful to know that our God didn't say, I am fed up with them. I don't want anything to do with them. Anymore. Listen, if they want to go their own way, off they go. No, God is patient with us. And even when we rush ahead, even perhaps when he lets us go the way that we have chosen, he always remains patient with us and he comes back. And he teaches us again. Friends, how many times have we told the Lord Jesus, you know, maybe, maybe during a sermon, you know, I'm going to pray more. I'm going to give my heart to being a man or woman of prayer. And two weeks later, we're back to the way we were before, where we can hardly say two minutes of a prayer before we fall asleep. How many times have we said, Lord, you know, I'm going to worship you more fully. You know, when I come to church, I'm going, I'm going to give myself over to you. I'm going, I'm going to focus my attention on you absolutely and completely. I'm going to have times in worship at my home. I'm going to spend time with you, Lord. I'm going to switch the television off. I'm going to close the book. I'm going to switch the phone off. And I'm just going to spend that time glorying and wondering in your presence. And a week later... You know, that screen time on your phone seems to be ramping up that figure, you know. So it's almost unimaginable. There's, not, there's, there's more hours on your screen time than there is in the day. How many times have we told the Lord Jesus, I'm going to walk more faithfully. I'm going to stop doing that. I'm going to start to do this. I'm going to not do this anymore. And I'm going to endeavor to do this. And then a short time later, we've forgotten everything. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about uh, we pay, you know, we made our vows to God, but we don't pay them. But God doesn't forget about us, does He? God doesn't go. There's a lost cause. There's somebody who can't even keep going for a week. There's a boy who can't even keep going for a couple of hours. Here's a woman who cannot even keep her word for a day or two. No. For God is patient with us, and He needs to be. Because we all make promises like this. We all make vows like this. We're all rash like this at times. But we thank God that he refuses to be impatient. Because God is patient. And I want to think about that for a minute or two. God's patience. Verses 6 to 9. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. I do find this interesting. Samuel's all head up, isn't he? He's the one who's been half of the problem. And he's all head up with the people of God because he thinks they've rejected him. It's fascinating in human nature, isn't it? And Samuel prayed to the Lord and the Lord said to Samuel, obey the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. 
according to all the deeds that they have done, from the day that I brought them up out of Egypt to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then obey their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. Samuel's all head up because he thinks they're rejecting him. He's all offended because he's such a good leader. He's such a good man. He doesn't recognize his failure. And he goes to God and he rehearses his problems. He rehearses his woes. And God speaks to them the truth. Listen, it's not about you. It's about me. And my people have always been like this. Did you notice that? He's, this, this isn't a one-off. You know, sometimes we think that our rejection of God is so bad that it's nothing like it in all the world. But listen to what God says of his people. From the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. What are you saying? I brought my people out of slavery in Egypt. I brought them through the wilderness, brought them over the Red Sea, brought them into the promised land. I've done all of this and fed them, watered them, looked after them, encouraged them. I've went all their lives. They have relied on me and I have been there and they have always been forsaking me, always been serving other gods. And you're just getting a little bit of a taste of it now and you can't bear it. You see the patience of our God? It wasn't like Samuel's patience that was wearing thin at the first hint of trouble. No, God was patient. And for instance, 1 Samuel, he showed he's been patient. God has provided a way uh, for his people to be delivered from Eli's sons. Samuel was that solution. And he is now going to provide a way of rescue for them to be rescued from Samuel's sons. Friends, God is patient. God had provided salvation for his people, but Samuel wouldn't listen, and the people would not wait. They didn't want God to rule over them, and Samuel thought it was all about him, as we human beings do. But do you notice the solution? He tasked Samuel with warning the people. He says, listen to what they say, do what they tell you, but warn them that it's not going to be easy. You see, this is something we have to understand about the patience of God. You see, the patience of God is that while there was still hope, he was going to continue to teach his people what they needed to know. God's patience is not passive. God's patience is not standing back and saying, get on with it. I've left you now. I've abandoned you. I don't want anything to do with you. That's not God's patience. God's patience is active. God's patience is working. God's patience is moving. God's patience is that whenever you run from Him, whenever you go away from Him, when you wander away, when you deliberately run from Him, He goes after you and he teaches you what you need to do. He brings you back to the place where you rejected him and he makes you think it through again until you get it right. Friends, our God is the one who is committed to teaching us the truth, of teaching us who he is. We've seen it seven chapters ago. He was doing it for Israel and now he's doing it again. And we know that we need him to do that for us because we know who we are. Friends, isn't it a wonderful thing when we know our God is patient with us? It makes all the difference in the world. And you know what the wonderful thing is? His patience is in his very essence, in his very being. Exodus 34, 5 to 6. Remember his pronouncement to Moses? The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful, gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Friends, this is the name of the God that you serve. This is the name of the God that saved you. This is the name of the God who loves you and who walks with you. He's a God who's merciful, gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And we treat him as if he's fickle. We treat him as if he is 
prickly. We treat him as if he is uh, someone who takes offense at everything that we do. That's not our God. And it's never been our God. We look through the Bible. We see Abraham. What did Abraham do? Abraham lied when it came to Sarah, his wife. And he did it twice. But he was God's man. David committed adultery with Bathsheba and then murdered her husband to cover it up. Yet he was God's man. Solomon committed adultery, or sorry, idolatry and trying to please his many wives and yet he was God's man. Peter in his brashness ran and always did the wrong thing. But he was God's man. It's hard for us to understand, isn't it? Because God calls us to holiness. He calls us to seek to follow him. He calls us to seek to walk in the path that he has set for us. And yet he tells us he's patient with us. Well, he is. He's patient not so we will go on and sin. Not so we will keep on lying. He's patient so he can bring us to the point where we will learn not to. Friend, Abraham lied and was rejected. Rejected by the people who cared for him, who looked after him. It was a long time before he learned the lesson not to do that anymore. David mourned because of his lust and his murder and had to learn that was not the way that he ought to conduct himself as God's king. Solomon drifted from God into a life of philosophical loneliness because of his idolatry. And it was a long time before he came back to the place where he knew God. Peter had the ignominy of denying he even knew Jesus with oaths and curses until he was brought back into the fold and preach that great sermon on the day of Pentecost. This is our God. This is the one that we serve. He is patient with us because he wants to teach us the truth. He wants to show us who he is. He wants us to know him and all his wonder and majesty and reality. And that takes patience because we are bad learners. We're slow and we're obstinate. But he will not give up on us. Friends, He is determined to teach us. What does Paul tell us in Romans? For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. This is the very reason why God saved you. This is the destiny he set before you the moment you put your trust in him that you would be conformed to the image of a son. And friend, God says he's going to do it, then he's going to do it. Jesus says he's going to do it, then he's going to do it. The Holy Spirit says he's going to do it, then he's going to do it. We can trust their word. This is what they have for us. And friends, what this message, what this passage reminds us is that whenever we rebel against God, whenever he is patient with us and teaches us the truth, and we say, no, I'm going to do it himself, what are we doing? We're just robbing ourselves of the joy and wonder of knowing God. We're just robbing ourselves of the joy and wonder of walking through this life with God. We're denying ourselves. We're putting ourselves in a difficult place. We're sending ourselves back to the beginning. We're ruining our lives. But that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that God will forget about us. God is patient. And I, for one, am so thankful that he is. So here we are. It's uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8. And we could be right back in 1 Samuel chapter 1, uh, given all that's happened, and now we're right back at the beginning again. And yet, and yet the wonder is that God is still on the journey with his people, isn't it? That's the amazing thing. Perhaps... Friends, you're at the beginning of a journey that you've already wondered. Perhaps you haven't learned the lessons of the past and God is bringing you back. Perhaps in recent days, maybe he will confront you. 
with some lesson that you should have learned 20 years ago. Friends, don't despair. That's, that's the point. Do not despair. Whatever we as individuals or as a church face, we can be sure of one thing, even if it's the same lesson again and again. Our God is patient with us, and he is teaching us, and he will continue to teach us as long as we are able to learn. I don't know about you, but one of the saddest things in the world is when a child stops learning. When their progress into adult is stifled by their inability to learn new things. How sad it would be for us as Christians. What a, what a dire thing it would be for us as a church if we were not able to learn. But not only that, unwilling, if we became unwilling to learn what God is teaching. If we refused to heed our Father's voice. If we refused to follow Christ's example, if we refused to respond to the Spirit's prompting, that is the greatest tragedy in the spiritual terms, isn't it? Because when we're there, we're languishing. We're languishing. Perhaps in the same old rubbish we've been doing through for years. Friends, it's time to get up and do something different. It's time to stand up, and instead of ignoring what God says... Even if we don't understand why he says it, just doing what he says. Because he knows what we need. And we don't. We have tried our way maybe 10 times, maybe 20 times, maybe 30 times. We have put our best in it, and every time it's come up as a bust. But Christ knows. Rest in him. He is patient. He is keeping on teaching us. He has lessons that we still need to learn and must learn. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you so much for your patience with us. Lord, Lord, we know that at times we're like rebellious children, stomping our feet, tutting and screaming, battering the floor with our fists as if that makes a difference to who you are. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to stand up under your tutelage. Help us to heed your lessons. Help us to put them into practice in our lives, setting aside what we think and trusting in you. And help us to walk forward. Help us to go on. Help us to move, learning the lessons of today and stepping and moving on to the lessons of tomorrow so that we see you more fully than we ever have before. Amen. Amen.